Good afternoon. Happy Bastille Day. Happy Bastille Day. Can always count on you, Matt, to uh, respond to the greeting. Uh, just one element at the top. Uh, the United States is concerned by continued detentions, indictments, and harassment of Egyptian civil society leaders, academics, and journalists, including the indictment of Director General of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, EIPR, Hussam Bagat. Mr. Bagat is a highly respected advocate for human rights, and EIPR works to strengthen and protect rights in Egypt. The targeting and prosecution of the staff of EIPR and other NGOs, including those charged in Case 173, degrades the rights of all Egyptians to freedom of expression and association, and it threatens the stability and prosperity of Egypt. We've communicated to the Egyptian government our strong belief that individuals such as Hossam Bagat should not be targeted for expressing their views peacefully. As Secretary Blinken said in April, the United States will stand with brave human rights defenders, journalists, and advocates around the world. We believe all people should be allowed to express their political views freely, to assemble and associate peacefully. As a strategic partner, we've raised these concerns with the Egyptian government, and we will continue to do so going forward. Matt. Thanks. Uh, two uh, br extremely brief logistical things before I get in. Uh, one, um, the International Religious Freedom Summit was uh, is to yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This is a, something that the previous administration had made a big deal out of, and um, I noticed that the secretary was invited to speak, but he was not sent. Power did address it this morning, but the secretary um, was invited. It's not on a schedule. Did he decide that this is not something that uh, merits his uh, merits his time? Uh, well, as you know, Matt, the secretary believes deeply uh, in international religious religious freedom. You've actually heard him uh, speak on the topic uh, in this very room. Uh, so, so when it comes to the logistics of the con of the conference, we'll have more for you uh, on that. Okay, yep. so you're suggesting that he might, in fact, we will, we will accept have more, the invitation. We will okay. have more for you. On All right, uh, and then secondly, um, th there was a call this, uh, there was or a meeting this morning between uh, Jake Sullivan and the French Foreign Minister, and um, and I don't expect you to talk about that, but uh, there was also a call that the Secretary had with the Canadian Foreign Minister today, mm -hmm. and the Secretary will be meeting with Foreign Minister Le Drian later today, um, but in the the readouts of both Jake's uh, meeting and the Secretary's call with the Canadian. Um, the word Haiti is not mentioned at all, and I'm just wondering, uh, is, did they discuss Haiti, at least from the Secretary's, uh, in the Secretary's call? Matt, if I uh, recall the readout, it did make a reference to the Western Hemisphere, uh, and I think specifically uh, a reference to... Big hemisphere. I, I, there, there's a lot going on in the hemisphere too. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, Haiti is top of mind uh, for uh, the secretary. Uh, in this hemisphere, hemisphere, there are other uh, uh, countries as well. They're top of mind, yeah. Cuba and Venezuela among them that we talked about here yesterday alone. Uh, so I can assure, assure you okay, that they, issues... So they did talk about Haiti and Cuba? I, I can assure you Not that, just the that, Western that hemisphere issues the of, Monroe Doctrine? That involved. issues of uh, democracy and human rights uh, and yeah. working together with our closest allies uh, and partners in the world uh, in France would certainly qualify uh, as one of our closest allies, uh, okay. that issue did come up. On a, a more substantive uh, matter, on, on Iran and this um, plot that was uh, <clears throat> came to light yesterday, uh, and the fact that you guys are continuing, according to what uh, uh, Rob Malley has said, uh, I guess on the record and TV, you know, there's that. Uh, I, I, I'm just curious as to you know, this is the this is at least the second time that uh, the Iranian government has, quote unquote, been caught, uh, allegations obviously, trying to, uh, you know, commit nefarious acts on U.S. soil while uh, the administration at the time, this one and then the Obama administration, were, um, you know, pursuing uh, negotiations on uh, nuclear negotiations. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, why are you continuing to do this if this government has shown no inclination that it's willing to stop uh, this kind of malign behavior that you and 
the previous administration and the mm -hmm. administration prior to that and before that too have all called out. Well, Matt, uh, as you know, we are careful not to weigh in on the specifics of law enforcement uh, investigations and law enforcement uh, matters. But obviously, uh, as you know, the Department of Justice did release uh, quite a detailed uh, charging document yesterday. Uh, and let me be very clear, we categorically condemn uh, this reported plot to kidnap a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil. There should be uh, no doubt about where uh, this administration, including the State Department, stands. Uh, we will, as we have, uh, forcefully defend U.S. citizens and U.S. interests. And that includes uh, in the context of law enforcement actions, like the one that the Department of Justice announced yesterday, um, as well as the actions uh, the President uh, has taken to defend our interests uh, in the region from Iranian-backed militant groups. Uh, it also includes, and this is important, our ongoing diplomatic efforts to constrain Iran's nuclear program. Uh, we've made this point before, but it is an urgent concern. Every challenge we face with Iran is made more difficult, made more intractable uh, when Iran's nuclear program is uncontrolled, when it is unconstrained. Um, the JCPOA, to be clear, when it was in full effect, uh, was successful in permanently and verifiably preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, and that's why we're seeking that return to mutual compliance. As the Justice Department's actions uh, prove, we will continue to address the other challenges that we have in our relationship with Iran, or in the context of the challenges and threats that Iran poses to the region uh, and beyond. But as I said before, every single one of those is made more difficult, is more complex for us to confront when we have uh, the potential threat of an uncontrolled uh, Iranian nuclear program uh, on the horizon. Uh, let me put that a slightly different way. Constraining Iran's nuclear program by returning to the JCPOA, by seeing to it once again that Iran's nuclear program is permanently and verifiably uh, 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 in a box, uh, that will put us in a better position to address all of the other challenges that we have. The simple fact of the matter, and you uh, referred to the previous administration and the one before that, um, but ever since the U.S. withdrew from the JCPOA, none of the challenges we have with Iran, and again, they are many, uh, have gotten better. And in fact, most of them uh, have gotten worse. Uh, that starts with the unconstrained activities in the nuclear program. We've talked a great deal about the attacks by these Iran-backed militias. DOJ has spoken uh, to this alleged <laughs> plot. Uh, so yes, uh, to be clear, uh, we intend to continue our effort to limit Iran's nuclear program through a mutual return to compliance, uh, just as we continue to go about actively confronting uh, the range of threats we see from Iran to include those that may be targeting or in some ways implicating American citizens and American interests. Uh, we demonstrated that yesterday. The president has demonstrated in the past. And this department will continue to demonstrate that uh, through our principled, clear-eyed diplomacies but, to seek to effect a mutual return to the JCPOA. But literally, like less than an hour <clears throat> or less than two hours before the DOJ announced this indictment, you were up there right where you're standing right now, saying that you're in indirect but active discussions with the Iranians on prisoners. While, in fact, someone should have known in this building that DOJ was about to unveil, un, un, you know, unseal an indictment saying that the Iranians were plotting to do the same thing again. So, so is the implication what, that we no, should... The no, there's no implication. I'm just I mean, it, it, this part of it, quite apart from the nuclear issue, is continuing and getting and getting worse, and yet there doesn't seem to be any impact. It doesn't seem to have any impact. No, well, in, or in, make any or, or make any difference. In, in some ways, areas. you're you're not wrong, and I think we're we're making the same point right. that many of the challenges we face with Iran have become uh, more pointed, uh, more complex, more intractable since uh, the previous administration left the nuclear deal. But if the implication is that because we face a range of threats from Iran that we shouldn't seek to affect 
the return of Americans who are unjustly held overseas, or that we shouldn't seek to verifiably and permanently prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? Uh, that's not a logic that this administration buys well, into, I'm at least. I'm not implying anything of the sort, but I'm just asking you how, how it makes sense, because if you look at it from the outside, it seems a bit ridiculous that you guys are talking, continuing to talk to them, apart from the nuclear issue, about prisoners. When they're plotting to kidnap, they're plotting to take this, more. Matt, we, you've heard this any number of occasions, but we don't negotiate with our closest friends. <laughs> Uh, we negotiate to solve the most difficult challenges mm -hmm. we but, face, and uh, Iran's nuclear program is certainly one well, of them. Last one, last one. On, uh, the, yeah, it's on this. Uh, you, you said that it's gotten worse. The situation mm -hmm. has gotten worse since the previous administration pulled out. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, since, um, uh, since this administration took office, while it's been getting worse, and while the Iranian violations of the, of the JCPOA uh, are, are becoming more profound, you guys have, have not imposed any additional penalties uh, on Iran. Uh, in fact, you've removed some. And I'm not talking about yesterday and the, the money, the South Korean. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Treasury removing specific people that you called good sanctions hygiene, remember. Um, so in fact, the amount of pressure that this administration is putting on is less than what it was before. How, how does that, how, how do you square that? Uh, Matt, I, I think you are um, uh, overlooking uh, some of the activity that we have taken, including taking action uh, against Iran with sanctions for some of the egregious human rights abuses uh, that we've seen in Iran. In the course of this administration, uh, we have enacted additional um, yeah, sanctions on Iran for human rights abuses. Uh, of course, recently uh, we <clears throat> sanctioned uh, a network uh, of Quds Force operatives uh, who were funding the Houthis uh, in Yemen. Uh, we have continued to pursue, uh, through sanctions and other tools, Iran's um, proxies uh, in the region, militant groups. Yeah, uh, so of those I, are nuclear related, and what you're talking about, and what you well, just what you just oh, acknowledged sorry, I, at I, the I, top is that. Oh, I'm sorry. It's I, thought, I, thought, I thought you were talking about. No, uh, we we are in. Uh, we are complete in agreement that ever since. The United States left the nuclear deal, that the <clears throat> JCPOA, uh, that the challenge posed by Iran's nuclear program has grown more pronounced. Right, Ar okay. Iran has continued so to distance what you, itself. And what have you done about it? I'll tell you what we've done about it. We have engaged now in six rounds of principled, uh, clear-eyed negotiations, indirect, uh, in an effort to return to a state where Iran is permanently and verifiably prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, we continue to believe, and successive administrations uh, had believed, that through diplomacy, diplomacy presents the best means to control, verifiably and permanently, Iran's nuclear program. Okay, we, we, six we rounds still... of talks is not actually doing anything other than talking. So is that is that, that that's your response to Iran's increasingly uh, increasing violations of its own commitments to the JCPOA? It, the, the the administration is it thinks that going to Vienna and talking we, with them we is, continue is the to response, think we continue to response. think that the best outcome okay. would be in Iran that is verifiably and permanently barred from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon. That's correct, Nick. Yep. <clears throat> does does there come to be a point at which the administration decides that Iran's behavior, malign behavior, this attempted kidnapping, whatever it may be, in other areas are so egregious that it means you can no longer negotiate in good faith with them in Vienna on the nuclear issue? Well, uh, there are two separate issues here, and, and one of which we've spoken to in recent days. Uh, as I've made very clear, uh, the United States is prepared to resume indirect talks with Iran to resume that seventh round uh, of negotiations. Um, we are ready uh, to go if and when uh, the Iranians uh, signal they are as well, and that's precisely because we want to see Iran's nuclear program once again verifiably and permanently constrained and Iran permanently barred uh, from ever obtaining uh, a nuclear weapon. Now, on the question of, uh, on, in, on that front, um, this process is not indefinite, as the Secretary has said, as you've heard me reiterate. Uh, there will come a point where our calculus will change, uh, where the gains that Iran is able to make uh, in its nuclear program, uh, the, the benefits it accrues might one day outweigh uh, 
uh, the benefit that the international community would accrue from a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, we're not there yet, um, but that is why we believe uh, we should, uh, the international community, the United States, together with our closest allies and some of our partners uh, in the form of the P5 plus one should return uh, to Vienna for these talks um, just as soon as we can. Uh, now, there's a broader issue um, that you raise uh, that <clears throat> suggests that because Iran is engaging uh, in this behavior in other realms, does that implicate uh, our view of nuclear negotiations? Our view continues to be that every single challenge that Iran poses in the non-nuclear realm is made more difficult when Iran's nuclear program is unconstrained, when it is potentially uncontrolled. Uh, so uh, to us, uh, if we are able to uh, control uh, and see Iran's nuclear program once again permanently and verifiably constrained, uh, that will enable us to better, uh, in some cases, diplomatically uh, take on, and in other cases, confront uh, in other ways uh, the challenges that, uh, the, the broader set of challenges that Iran poses. Uh, it may not be a coincidence that, as I said before to Matt, uh, the the challenges that Iran has posed to us in the non-nuclear realm have not gotten better since the United States left the JCPOA. In fact, in most cases, uh, they've gotten far worse. Yes, well, just, just okay. staying on this yeah. on the plot. Um, the, four, the, the four Iranian officials that were indicted are never likely to see the inside of a U.S. courtroom. So I, I know you'll say that that's a law enforcement matter, but what more is the administration willing to do to respond to the Iranian government because of this plot, for this plot? Well, um, you, you saw uh, DOJ um, make light uh, of this. You have seen them unveil uh, these charges. Uh, you've also seen this administration uh, make very clear that we will always take action when it's in our, in, when our, when it's in our interest and when it's appropriate uh, to do so. Uh, we have used uh, the tools available to us from sanctions to, in a couple cases, military force. Uh, so again, we don't preview uh, any steps that we may take, um, but we do have a pretty expansive toolkit, and we've made no secret of the fact that we're prepared to use it. This administration launched a policy specifically for this kind of activity. The Khashoggi ban is for right. counter dissident, extraterritorial. Why wouldn't this warrant sanctions then? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ruling anything in, I'm not ruling anything out, uh, but you're exactly right that we do have uh, a number of tools at our disposal, uh, including the Khashoggi ban. Uh, we have uh, uh, just announced the Khashoggi ban in February, I believe it was. It's already been used and uh, applied in dozens uh, of cases, um, but we are uh, always reviewing cases uh, that may implicate the Khashoggi ban and may be appropriate um, uh, to use it. Sean. Anything else on Iran? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. Please. Okay. Um, one real quick on Iran. Yeah. Um, the president today Rouhani, more or less acknowledged that negotiations will go to his successor, that they won't be able to finalize a deal on the JCPOA in the next few weeks. Is that the U.S. assessment as well? You know, uh, these questions are best addressed uh, towards Iran, uh, as we've made very clear. Um, we are prepared to return to Vienna for uh, a seventh round uh, of talks. Uh, we understand that uh, the Iranians are still undergoing consultations. Um, uh, as we've always said, uh, Iran will have to make tough political decisions, including the strategic decision of whether it's willing uh, to uh, entertain a mutual return to compliance. Only Iran uh, can tell us that. I, I understand uh, Rouhani also said that um, the collective approach to negotiations has been serious and businesslike. Uh, we wouldn't take issue uh, with that. But again, um, if and when uh, there's a seventh round, and we certainly hope there is one, um, that is a question that is best uh, addressed to uh, Tehran. Um, can I just follow up on your remarks at the beginning? Was this Iran? Oh, no. Uh, one more question on Iran. Yep. Um, do you think that this is a matter where you, there was a, you made a comment about how we don't negotiate with our friends as a rule? Um, is this a is this kidnapping issue a matter where you think some kind of negotiation needs to take place to to put the the, the Iranian uh, habit of pension for kidnapping in a box, or is that something where 
um, where more punitive action would have to take place to, to change their calculus on that file. Uh, as we've said, we're engaged in indirect discussions uh, with the Iranians on an urgent basis to try to uh, secure the release of the Americans uh, who are unjustly uh, and outrageously uh, held against their will in Tehran. But look, we don't think, uh, as a, uh, taking a step back, that this is something uh, as a broader issue or tactic that we should be negotiating over. Uh, this is a practice that is abhorrent. It is a practice that uh, the United States, together with many of our closest allies, uh, have condemned in the strongest possible terms. The Canadians, our Canadian partners, our friends and neighbors, uh, have put together um, a, an effective campaign to put attention on the practice of some nation states uh, for uh, hostage taking, kidnapping, abductions, whatever you want to call it for political leverage. Uh, we are working concertedly with the international community uh, to do all we can to see to it that this is a practice uh, that is um, relegated to the dustbin of history and that uh, doesn't uh, continue to occur. Uh, the fact that Iran uh, has done this is uh, something that is uh, deeply um, abhorrent and, and, and outrageous. Uh, and. Um, as we work on the broader uh, uh, challenge, we are working on what we hope is the nearer term challenge of seeking to affect the return, the release of these Americans who are unjustly detained uh, in Iran. Uh, Sean. Um, could I just follow up your comments at the beginning on Egypt? Um, you voiced the concern about detentions of, of, uh, of civil society leaders. Uh, what effects will that have on U.S. policy? It's been widely reported the administration is considering further arms sales to Egypt. Are those uh, do you, do you see a linkage with that? Is that uh, are those in jeopardy if uh, if there is an action on uh, on human rights? Well, human rights is an issue that we have consistently and very clearly raised repeatedly uh, with our Egyptian partners. And his for first phone call uh, with Egyptian President Sisi, President Biden, uh, raised the issue of human rights. Uh, as you know, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, has spoken with his Egyptian counterpart on a number of occasions. Human rights uh, have featured in those discussions. Uh, Secretary Blinken met with President Sisi in, in Cairo. Uh, human rights were on the agenda in that discussion as well. The United States signed on uh, to a statement at uh, HRC 46 uh, calling for Egypt to improve uh, its human rights uh, record. And President Biden, even before he assumed office, uh, was very clear as a candidate that uh, even when it comes to our closest security partners, uh, we wouldn't overlook human rights um, in the name of security, stability, any other interests that we might have. Our values and our interests uh, are both of tremendous importance to us, and this administration is not prepared uh, to sacrifice one for uh, the other. So, of course, not going to get ahead of, of where we are um, in, in terms of any bilateral relationship or any um, uh, funding or assistance announcements, uh, but human rights across the board is something we look at very closely in making those decisions. Sure. Could I switch to Afghanistan? Any, uh, sure, Afghanistan. Um, the, uh, the operation that's been announced uh, today, I realize it's probably more of a Pentagon issue in terms of logistics, but first of all, in terms of um, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad, he said in May when he was testifying on the Hill that he didn't oppose this, but he said one of the one of the I'm paraphrasing him says one of the concerns was that this would uh, set off potentially a, p a panic that people will be flooding out, etc. What what has changed since then? Has is there a sense that the situation has deteriorated to the point that this became necessary? What, why um, you know is there a concern that this will uh, affect the stability of Afghanistan in terms of uh, people coming home? Well, I, I think what you heard today from the White House is reflective of the priority that the entire administration places on fulfilling uh, what we've called a special responsibility. It's a special responsibility that we have and that we owe to the many brave Afghans who oftentimes at great personal risk and sometimes at great risk to uh, their families have assisted the United States in different ways over the course of uh, some two decades. Um, so in announcing uh, some of the details behind Operation Allies uh, Refuge, today uh, you heard from uh, the White House how we are uh, organized to tackle uh, this, uh, uh, this effort. Uh, and it is something that the State Department has long been working uh, urgently on. 
uh, and the SIV program, uh, of course, uh, well predates uh, the President's uh, announcement of the military withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, in recent months, the State Department, and we've uh, talked about this in recent days, uh, has uh, added additional resources uh, to that effort. Again, to move as urgently uh, as we can to process uh, as many um, uh, of those who are eligible uh, for this program uh, as we can. Uh, when, even when we announced uh, a change in staffing at our embassy in Kabul earlier this year, uh, we made the point that we would be in a position to send additional uh, individuals to help uh, with the SIV processing, and that's uh, precisely what we did. And even in the context of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak in Kabul uh, that uh, affected our uh, posts there, uh, in-person interviews were suspended for a time, as we said, but uh, the processing uh, continued. And I can say that uh, because of those increased resources, uh, we managed to uh, increase the pace uh, of that processing over time. Um, as you may know, we issue quarterly reports uh, that detail uh, our ability to process uh, SIV applicants. And just to give you uh, a snapshot of that, the embassy in Kabul in, uh, uh, issued 299 special immigrant visas in March, 299. 356 were issued in April, and 619 uh, in May, the most recent month, month for which data is uh, available. Uh, and now I know relationships are not always causal, um, but in this case, we are confident that it is. We are confident that the additional resources uh, that we have put, uh, put towards this issue uh, has resulted in the increased pace uh, of this processing. Uh, we will continue to do all we can consistent uh, with this program that is enshrined in legislation uh, and that involves more than a dozen steps to continue to accelerate the processing uh, time. And as you heard, uh, the White House again today reiterated that uh, flights from Afghanistan uh, will begin uh, later this month for a group of these SIV applicants uh, if they so choose to be re relocated outside of Afghanistan. And just briefly, the, um, do you have numbers on how many people would be potentially affected by this, how many people would be taken out, and on where they would be temporarily uh, living, housed, uh, until as their applications are being processed? So as we said, we have uh, identified a group uh, of SIV applicants who have served in any number of roles, uh, translators, interpreters, uh, as well as other individuals who have assisted us uh, who may be uh, at some risk. Uh, these are individuals uh, who uh, at the moment have the option uh, to be relocated outside of Afghanistan before we complete that military uh, drawdown uh, in order to complete their special uh, immigrant visa uh, processing. Importantly, these are individuals who are already in uh, that SIV processing uh, pipeline. Uh, you've heard us say that uh, our top priority in all of this is the safety and security of these SIV applicants. They have already, uh, in many cases at great risk to themselves, uh, assisted the United States over the years. And so we don't want to do anything uh, that might potentially uh, jeopardize their safety and security going forward. And so uh, there are going to be uh, some details that we may not be able to uh, provide. Uh, and so right now we don't have anything to offer in terms of uh, the size uh, of that group, uh, uh, areas to where they may be uh, relocated. Uh, but it is safe to say that we are planning for a range of contingencies. Uh, we are moving as swiftly as we can in the processing. And you heard from the White House again today uh, that those flights uh, will begin later this month. Kylie. Can I just ask you um, a kind of logistical question? That quarterly report that you are mm -hmm. referencing, um, my understanding was that that was months late giving it to Congress. So when is the last time that you provided that report to Congress and when can we expect the next report? Uh, these, the numbers that I cited are available online, uh, so they're available publicly. Um, uh, when the next report may come out, uh, we'll see if we can uh, get that information okay. for you. And then um, just following up uh, on CNN's reporting and video um, of the Taliban uh, fighters executing 22 unarmed Afghan commandos as they uh, tried to surrender, um, what is your response to that and has the State Department uh, directly been in contact with the Taliban about this? 
Well, uh, the video, uh, which I should say we don't have any reason to doubt, uh, depicts horrifying scenes. Uh, the uh, killing, in this case the slaughter, of unarmed individuals uh, is um, it's an atrocious act. It's an outrageous sight. Uh, and of course, uh, we condemn it. Um, we've been very clear about this, that we continue to believe uh, the Islamic Republic, that is to say the Afghan government, uh, continues to believe uh, that diplomacy is the only uh, durable and just way to reach a political settlement here. Um, I won't speak for the Taliban, uh, but they continue to engage in that diplomacy in Doha. Um, the uh, Islamic Republic, the Afghan government, uh, is sending a senior delegation to Doha. Uh, the uh, special envoy and, and his team uh, are engaged uh, supporting these intra-Afghan uh, discussions uh, in Doha. Uh, we continue to believe, uh, and the international community continues to believe, including if you look at recent statements uh, from uh, some of our closest allies, but also from uh, countries with whom we uh, share little else, that uh, this diplomatic path uh, is uh, the most effective and certainly the best path uh, to bring peace and stability to Afghanistan, to um, afford uh, and offer the Afghan people uh, what has eluded them over the course of not only the past 20 years um, since 9-11, but really the past 40 uh, with the violence they've endured in their own country. And can I just follow up? Last week you said, however, that you it's the United States position that the Taliban, um, their efforts to engage in Doha demonstrate that they understand that diplomacy is the path forward here uh, to gaining legitimacy. Do you still believe that? And are you on the same page as the Pentagon, who has said some different things about the intentions of the Taliban? Well, on your second question, uh, I don't believe we said we have said different things at all. Um, what uh, I said uh, the other day is that, quote, the Taliban, too, understands that only through diplomacy can they garner any sort of legitimacy. Uh, my Pentagon colleague certainly didn't say anything uh, different from that. Uh, and it is the opinion of this government, it is the opinion of the international community, uh, that any government, the inter international community broadly, I should say, that any government that comes to power through the barrel of a gun, that comes to power through force in Afghanistan, any government that doesn't respect fundamental and universal rights is not one that will have legitimacy in the eyes of the broad international community. It is not one that will have the support of the Afghan people. And now I've heard quite a few of you um, ask, well, so what? Well, it's very important uh, because any government, future government of Afghanistan that wants durability will have to be one that governs justly. Uh, and what we seek is a just and durable outcome and only through uh, diplomacy, only th through um, the Afghan people having a say, uh, will any future government be able to accrue that legitimacy, will be able to accrue assistance from the international community, which has been vital, indispensable, I would say, uh, to uh, the Afghan government. Uh, and that's why uh, only through that process um, will any future government a be able to achieve that durability? Let me ask again somewhat that same question, because I've been harping on this for, for days now. And I just, uh, what, what does it say? How do you square your idea that they might care about international legitimacy with the idea, one, of what Kylie asked about, the slaughter mm -hmm. of these commandos who were trying to uh, surrender? the fact that the Indians have closed their consulate in Kandahar, the French are organizing, basically telling all French citizens to get the hell out and organizing an evacuation flight, and you are sending these visa seekers to other places because, precisely because you know 
that it's not safe for them, and your allies know it's not safe for their people. So I, I, I just don't understand how you can get up with a straight face and try and say, oh, well, it's all going to be okay because the Taliban want international legitimacy when there's no indication, even within this government, you don't really believe that. Matt, to be clear, this is, it's a tremendously challenging uh, set of circumstances. Um, but a couple points, and this is important. Uh, President Biden has emphasized this ever since he announced the military withdrawal. The United States is not abandoning Afghanistan. Yeah, you are. You basically say, he said, at, as it had been for ages and ages, for 20 years, it was a condition, it was supposed to be conditions-based withdrawal. The White House got up and said when he made the announcement that it no I, longer mattered what the I will have to stop you right there. I will have to stop, stop you right correct? there. That is did not Jake correct. Did Jake Sullivan not say that, that the that, president had decided that it would did, that withdrawal did not have to be conditions-based anymore would not be, and that it didn't matter what happened afterwards? Matt, as you know, the previous administration signed an agreement with the Taliban. What? That, well... <laughs> Am I wrong? Who, so I'm that, sorry, that, who is doing the withdrawal right now? It's that not that agreement, that agreement dictated that should our military personnel remain in Afghanistan past May 1st of this year, the status quo would have been eradicated. Our forces, American service members, would have starting, could have starting that very day, come under dire threat from a Taliban uh, that would once again start targeting Americans. This president, this administration uh, has no higher priority than the safety, the well-being of uh, Americans around the world, and that certainly includes uh, our service members. So the idea that we could have ignored an agreement that the previous administration arrived at, even if, as the president said, it may not have been the agreement that uh, this administration would have made, uh, it would have had dire implications for American service members. Uh, so the idea that the status quo could have endured until now, uh, that's just wrong. Uh, again, we intend to maintain a partnership with the Afghan government, with the people of Afghanistan, and certainly our intent to maintain a diplomatic presence so we can carry out uh, that, um, that partnership. And beyond that, uh, we will remain focused, just as this administration has since the earliest days, on the diplomatic process that currently is ongoing uh, in Doha uh, right now. And, uh, yes. On, on, um, and that's had his meetings, uh, if you have any readout uh, for his meetings in uh, Israel and Palestinian territories. And can you confirm the reports that the uh, U.S. consulate will be uh, reopened uh, in uh, September in Jerusalem? I'm not in a position to confirm uh, uh, any reports of that nature uh, at the moment. When it comes to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Amr, uh, as you know, he's uh, in the region. He's meeting uh, with Israeli officials, with uh, officials from the Palestinian Authority, uh, but he is also meeting with elements of uh, civil society. Uh, and as we talked about the other day, uh, it's that element of, of his uh, engagements uh, that is also uh, quite uh, important to him, it's quite important uh, to us, making clear that uh, the United States uh, is engaging broadly uh, with our Israeli partners and we are uh, re-engaging uh, and building back uh, that um, partnership with the Palestinian people. Uh, again, knowing that uh, at the end of the day, our policy is one uh, that seeks to achieve equal measures of safety, of security, of prosperity, uh, and importantly, of dignity for Israelis uh, and Palestinians alike. Um, if we have a fuller readout of uh, Das Amr's uh, trip, we'll be sure to provide it. One more uh, on Lebanon. Uh, will Lebanon be a topic of discussion between Secretary Blinken and his uh, French counterpart this afternoon? And does the U.S. support the EU sanctions on uh, uh, Lebanese political uh, leaders? Uh, I have every expectation that uh, Lebanon will, uh, in fact, uh, be a topic of conversation uh, between Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Le Drian, uh later today at uh, the French Embassy. As you know, uh, earlier this month, uh, um, uh, the, uh, or uh, la late last month uh, in Matera, 
uh, the Secretary had an opportunity to meet uh, with Foreign Minister Le Drian, uh, and uh, Saudi Foreign Minister uh, uh, Faisal bin Farhan uh, to uh, discuss this. Subsequent uh, to that, uh, our uh, ambassador to Lebanon, um, uh, Ambassador Shea, French Ambassador Angriot, uh, they met with the Saudi Ambassador uh, Walid Bukhari in Beirut for diplomatic consultations uh, as part of and a follow-on to that trilateral engagement on the dire economic situation uh, currently in place in Lebanon and to discuss how uh, together we can most effectively support uh, the needs of uh, the Lebanese um, people. And on the sanctions, EU sanctions on political leaders? Uh, I, I don't have any um, uh, anything for you there. Thank you. Uh, quickly back on Afghanistan. Um, who will care for the Afghans once they are removed from Afghanistan? Will it be state or DHS? And how many flights will this involve? How much will this operation cost? And then it appears that many of the Taliban's fighters have been allowed by Pakistan to cross into Afghanistan to join the fighting. Pakistan reportedly also is allowing Taliban fighters to be treated in Pakistani hospitals. It also continues to provide sanctuary for the Taliban's political and military committees and leaders. Is this acceptable to the United States? While Pakistan has facilitated the peace process, does the U.S. believe it continues to provide any form of military support for the Taliban offensives? Well, we have said before that uh, this uh, conflict um, is not one that uh, the United States alone uh, either can or should solve. Uh, this is uh, a conflict that the international community uh, needs to be engaged on. Um, for many years, uh, the international community, some corners of it at least, uh, were content uh, to let the United States and uh, our NATO allies uh, take the uh, burden uh, in Afghanistan. Um, now, however, uh, is the time for the international community to show support uh, for the people of Afghanistan to be uh, constructively engaged uh, in the diplomatic process. When it comes to Pakistan, we know that Pakistan uh, has much to gain uh, from an Afghanistan uh, that is peaceful, that is stable, that's secure, uh, and uh, Pakistan has the potential to uh, have a critical role in enabling that outcome. We do appreciate Pakistan's efforts uh, to advance uh, the peace process and stability in South Asia, uh, including uh, by encouraging, as Pakistan has done, uh, the Taliban to engage in substantive uh, negotiations. Uh, when it comes to various details of uh, the SIV uh, applicants, uh, where they will go uh, as they await their processing, uh, who will care for them. Uh, we don't have any uh, further details for you uh, at the moment. Again, some of those details may be ones that uh, we won't be in a position to share uh, given operational uh, security uh, concerns. Yes? Thanks so much. This is John David from Airway News TV Pakistan. Um, sir, I, I hope you have seen some recent interviews of our Prime Minister Imran Khan and his articles in American media. Uh, he said that Pakistan will not allow any American base in Pakistan to carry out counterterrorism operations. So I just wanted to request you to clarify that has the United States asked Pakistan to provide any military base? Well, again, the United States and Pakistan share any number of interests. Uh, we have interests uh, in the realm of counterterrorism. Uh, we have interests uh, in the region. And those regional interests uh, certainly include uh, an Afghanistan that is stable, that is peaceful, uh, that is uh, secure. Uh, we have worked very closely with Pakistan uh, over the course of many years uh, in pursuit of uh, some of those uh, mutual uh, interests, uh, and I think I would leave it at that. So a couple of days ago, uh, you said that uh, legitimacy and assistance for any Afghan government can only be possible if that government has the consent of the Afghan people. So we all know that uh, Taliban has no democratic system. They just handpick their leaders. There's no voting. There's nothing. So is the world ready uh, to accept uh, any hardcore, non-democratic Islamic state in that part of the world now? 
Well, uh, I will tell you uh, what the world is not ready to accept, uh, and it is not ready to accept a government that comes to power only by force, that has no respect for the human rights uh, of the Afghan people, for the universal rights of the Afghan people. Uh, and this gets back uh, to the point before. Uh, that is not a government that will have legitimacy in the eyes of much in the international community. And importantly, it's not a government uh, that I would suspect will have uh, the assistance uh, of the international community. And any government uh, that uh, has a concern for its own durability um, uh, would obviously um, do well to keep that in mind. Is anyone from state going to this um, conference in Uzbekistan other than Zal? Uh, Special Envoy uh, Khalil oh, Zad uh, is, uh, is there. They're traveling there tomorrow, I believe. Right. But is anyone, are you aware of anyone else going in? Is there any, I mean, this is obviously focused on one issue, but mm -hmm. clearly Afghanistan withdrawal looms large in the background. Is, is there a concern here uh, within the administration or in this building, which I guess this would be the same thing, uh, that the Central Asian nations might not be so receptive to U.S. entreaties or appeals for, uh, uh, for, for, for help uh, in stabilizing Afghanistan, given the fact that you are leaving. I, I, I stopped myself from saying cutting and running, so uh, since, you're, since you're withdrawing. Is there a concern? And, but also I, the logistical point on anyone other than Zal going. Well, uh, Special Envoy Khalil Zad is, is our uh, senior uh, yeah. department official responsible um, for certainly uh, diplomacy uh, towards uh, uh, what we seek in Afghanistan. So he will be there um, with, um, uh, as the NSC uh, yeah. announced, uh, uh, Liz Sherwood Randall. Um, together, um, they will uh, represent the United States uh, in a conference hosted by the government of Uzbekistan. Uh, it will discuss a number of issues, but include that includes regional cooperation uh, and regional uh, connectivity. Uh, as you know, the secretary has had an occasion now uh, to meet uh, both in person uh, uh, with uh, some of our Central Asian partners and uh, virtually um, with the C5. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, these are countries, again, uh, with whom we share any number uh, of interests. Uh, we have uh, sought to engage them to deepen uh, that cooperation, and importantly, to deepen that regional connectivity that is so important to many of our uh, shared mutual interests. But interest. is there a concern that they might not be so receptive now, I, these, now, that, now, now that you're pulling out? Uh, these are countries that will make uh, sovereign decisions uh, about um, uh, what and how uh, uh, about um, their level of cooperation um, with the United States, what they are prepared to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, support for a stable uh, and secure and peaceful uh, Afghanistan. I think what I said before um, applies across the board, that uh, the international community uh, has a constructive role to play to support that goal. It's not only in our interests, and in fact, uh, it is much more, um, uh, it is certainly in uh, the immediate interests of Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, that Afghanistan uh, see a future that uh, one day is stable, peaceful, and secure. Uh, sorry, let me, I've, let me come back to you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Cuba and Haiti. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Department of Homeland Security's secretary said today uh, that Haitians and Cubans fleeing political violence and arriving on U.S. shores will not be permitted to enter the United States and instead will be sent to a third country. Given the State Department is responsible for third country referrals, are you in discussions with third countries? Has a third country agreed to take in Haitians and Cubans who are seeking refuge in that instance? Well, what Secretary Mayorkas uh, was illustrating yesterday was our uh, sincere concern um, with the reality, and that is that anyone who takes to the seas to seek refuge uh, in the United States, be it from Cuba uh, or from Haiti, um, would put their life at, own risk, at their own risk uh, and would not gain entry to the United States. Uh, this is a journey that uh, is dangerous uh, and not one that uh, would uh, allow them to secure entry. Uh, that was uh, really the humanitarian um, uh, concern that Secretary Mayorkas 
uh, was voicing yesterday. Um, I don't have anything for you on uh, uh, third countries. Obviously, uh, we work very closely with DHS um, when it comes to uh, uh, issues of asylum, um, uh, but I wouldn't want to comment beyond that. I have one more on Haiti. Um, you said, I believe the other day, it might have been yesterday, that you were waiting for consular access to all three Americans who had been arrested in Haiti. Uh, have you since had consular access to all We have Americans? continued to have uh, consular access to uh, detained Americans. I confirmed the other day that we're aware of three Americans uh, who have been detained as part uh, of the investigation. Um, uh, I'm not able to provide uh, additional details given privacy considerations. Follow up on Cuba? Sure. Uh, in this case. The, um, this gets to what you were discussing yesterday, mm -hmm. but uh, reportedly, uh, Cuba, the, the internet restrictions have been uh, eased slightly, but uh, the Cuban foreign minister yesterday um, accused the United States of, of orchestrating the protests again through, um, through, through Twitter campaigns, through social media campaigns. Do you have any further comment on the situation there with the internet? and also about the detention of a journalist for the Spanish newspaper, ABC, obviously. Well, when it comes to the detention of uh, Camila Acosta of, of ABC, um, uh, we know that the world is watching uh, as Cuban authorities arrest and beat dozens of uh, their own citizens, uh, and that includes journalists uh, and independent voices. We know that many remain missing. Uh, we join their families. Cuban human rights defenders and people around the world in calling for the immediate release of those detained or missing uh, for merely demanding freedom uh, by exercising uh, what is a universal right to free assembly uh, and free expression. Uh, violence and detentions of Cuban protesters and disappearances of independent activists uh, remind us, constantly remind us, that uh, many Cubans uh, pay uh, very dearly um, for exercising rights that should be uh, universal, um, and, and universal uh, means everywhere, uh, around the world, uh, and anyone. Um, when it comes to the internet shutdowns, uh, we spoke about this yesterday indeed, but uh, we do condemn uh, the use of partial or complete government-imposed internet shutdowns. Uh, we call on Cuba's leaders to demonstrate restraint and urge respect for the voice of the people by opening all means of communication, uh, both online and offline. The, um, the abuse of uh, journalists, of independent voices, the attempted uh, suppression, including through technological means, uh, of the voice of the Cuban people, uh, this is not something that could ever uh, silence or quell uh, the legitimate aspirations of the Cuban people for freedom, for human rights, uh, for what their uh, own government has denied to them uh, for far too long. Uh, let me, everyone, yes, I don't think I've called on you. This is going back again to Afghanistan. Um, what kind of role do you anticipate China to play, uh, especially now after the withdrawal? Are you worried about at all? about what China might do after the group withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan? Well, uh, you know, our relationship with China, as we say, is, is multifaceted. Uh, it is, uh, in some areas, uh, adversarial. Uh, it is, in many, if not most, areas, competitive. Uh, it is, in some areas, um, there are some areas in which our interests align and where there is the potential uh, for cooperation. Uh, we've talked about that in the context of climate, of course, in the context of uh, Iran's nuclear program, China, uh, the, China being a member of the P5 plus one. Um, but there is the potential uh, for constructive engagement on Afghanistan. Uh, and this goes back to the prior point, uh, that an Afghanistan that is uh, uh, more secure, that's more stable, that is peaceful, uh, that is not only in the interests of the United States of America, it is certainly in the interests of Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, it is in the interests of uh, the broader international community uh, as well. Uh, so we look to China as we do uh, other uh, regional countries uh, to play a role to, that is constructive uh, and that helps bring about uh, that outcome that is in our collective interest. Follow up on that. So are you saying that you're not worried at all about China, you know, working 
ex- exclusively with Taliban and not you know not necessarily worried about other other countries in the, or governments in the, that area trying to basically you know further dis- destabilize that that area or that region. I'm I'm saying that China, uh, as do uh, other countries, but China being, of course, an important um, country in the region, uh, has the potential uh, to uh, be a constructive uh, uh, force when it comes to the cause uh, of an Afghanistan that is more uh, secure, that is more stable, uh, that ultimately is peaceful. Uh, This has the potential to be one of those areas because it is an area where our interests do align, uh, where the United States and and, uh, the PRC can find uh, some area of agreement and uh, can work together uh, constructively. The ability to do that would certainly be uh, not only in our national interest, but also uh, the collective interest as well. Connor. Can I just ask you one question on uh, passports? I know we had the briefing this morning, but um, the, the State Department says that over 150 staffers are returning to the office this summer. But, but given the interest in travel, the, the rise in vaccination rates, the reopenings around the world, why wasn't the State Department more prepared to deal with this rush of passport applications? Well, as you know, Connor, uh, we are uh, weighing uh, uh, our uh, important mission sets uh, and also the safety, health, security of our personnel. Uh, and <clears throat> the uh, department uh, is still um, uh, in, in Washington here. Uh, we are still subject to uh, occupancy restrictions owing to the ongoing uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Uh, we have uh, been able, uh, both, you know, both here uh, at Maine State uh, and around the world, uh, to uh, gradually uh, resume operations, some operations that uh, had been slowed uh, over the course of the pandemic, and we certainly expect to be able to do more of that as conditions here uh, in this country uh, continue to improve. Uh, and it's certainly our hope that we'll be able to do uh, more of that uh, in our overseas installations as well. What's your message to Americans then whose passports are expired and had anticipated traveling this summer or even in the fall? Uh, given the fact that they wouldn't be able to to have their passport renewed, well, our message is that sorry, uh, our, our our do you want to come up here? <laughs> our uh, our our message, uh, Connor, is that we are working uh, just as expeditiously expeditiously as we possibly can, uh, knowing uh, that uh, the traveling public uh, has um, uh, legitimate interests uh, in. Uh, travel. We are, you know, gratified to see uh, travel become um, uh, possible once again, given that uh, the pandemic is easing, certainly in this country uh, and in other countries, uh, some other countries uh, around the world. Uh, we will continue uh, to contribute resources uh, to this very uh, important mission set. Yeah. Well, do you have any indication of when uh, the travel restrictions against the Schengen area might be lifted. And can you also uh, just give a little bit of the logic behind why the Schengen area continues to be listed on the travel ban, but other countries with higher infection rates, Indonesia, Colombia, Mexico, parts of Africa, Eastern Europe, Russia, are not on the, the banned list? The various travel restrictions will be lifted as soon as we safely and responsibly can. Uh, The uh, broader point here is that this is not a political decision. Uh, These are decisions that are informed uh, by uh, public health, uh, that are informed by uh, the science, uh, that are uh, going to be and uh, at the moment are being weighed uh, by our public health professionals, including at uh, the CDC. Uh, So as soon as those uh, who are Um, uh, expert in the field, uh, determine that it is safe uh, to uh, repeal the various travel restrictions. I assure you there will be no delay in doing so. Uh, We uh, understand the importance to uh, the traveling public, uh, to trade, uh, to our um, uh, relations and people-to-people ties with some of our closest allies and partners around the world. Uh, Quick final question. 
security assistance to Haiti, is the U.S. still considering sending, uh, or sorry, considering the request to send troops to pr protect key infrastructure? If so, what size of force, how many soldiers is being analyzed? Are there discussions about a UN-led or multilateral force? And if so, what countries are you talking to about this with? Well, um, we continue to evaluate uh, the Haitians, Haitian government's request for assistance to determine how best uh, the United States can address them. Uh, after close consultations, including in the context of the interagency delegation that was in Port-au-Prince on Sunday, uh, we believe our focus should be assisting the Haitian government with navigating the investigation into the assassination of President Moise, uh, determining who is culpable, supporting the Haitian government as it seeks justice uh, in this case. Uh, of course, the situation on the ground uh, is uh, evolving rapidly, and we continue uh, to be in close contact with our Haitian partners uh, about how we can best um, uh, assist. Um, I should also add that um, the Department of Justice, together with the Department of Homeland Security, um, is providing assistance to Haitian authorities. Uh, the uh, uh, Department of Justice uh, will continue to support uh, Haitian authorities uh, in their review of uh, the facts and the circumstances surrounding uh, this attack. Uh, we are also um, uh, taking a close look at the Haitian government's needs in the context of critical infrastructure uh, and how the United States might be able to assist uh, the Haitian government in protecting uh, that critical infrastructure. Um, just a moment to spend on uh, the State Department uh, in response to a request from the Haitian governments and building on longstanding cooperation. Uh, the Department of State is deploying an advisor to the Haitian National Police Judicial Police uh, and bringing on board an advisor to the Haitian National Police Inspector General. Uh, the advisor to the uh, Haitian National Police Judicial Police will provide technical assistance to build the capacity of the Haitian National Police to investigate and to address serious crimes. Uh, the advisor to the police's inspector general will help the HNP improve its capacity to address allegations of corruption, of human rights abuses, police misconduct. We also currently support uh, seven subject matter experts. Um, who advise the Haitian National Police on topics such as counter-narcotics and community policing uh, as well. Uh, we are also supporting training and procuring vehicles, radios, protective equipment uh, to build the capacity of the Haitian National Police uh, to protect uh, Haitians from violence. And then finally, um, in addition to the State Department support I just mentioned, uh, as I alluded to before, DHS uh, is sending experts from the Transportation Security Administration, or TSA, uh, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, uh, to work with their Haitian counterparts uh, in improving aviation and, as I mentioned before, critical infrastructure security uh, as well. Uh, Joel, quick final question. Yeah, just, just one follow-up on, on Cuba, your comments about the internet. Uh, matter of internet access there. Uh, Senator Rubio uh, has called for the U.S. to turn, use satellite-based technology to provide uh, to provide internet access to, to overcome, you know, Cuban government efforts to cut that. Is that something that the administration is considering? Uh, we are considering any number of ways, and we have considered any number of ways, uh, to support uh, the Cuban people. Um, that is to support them, uh, their humanitarian needs. It is to support them uh, in uh, their uh, broader efforts uh, to secure greater degrees uh, of, of liberty and freedom and, and human rights. Uh, uh, but I don't have anything specific to offer at this time. Thank you all very much.